welcome to your eighth podcast on Shakespeare. We just looked at the chronology of Shakespeare's plays and talked about the possible dating of the plays. And this handout is going to help you understand how we date the plays and also some, some of the, um, shall we say, the tones of the references, these early references to Shakespeare. So the first one is in 1592 to the upstart crow. Robert Greene clearly writes an invective uh, against Shakespeare in this. Robert Greene was university educated, as was, for example, Christopher Marlowe and some of the others, and they considered Shakespeare a complete nobody because he was an actor. And how could an actor write plays? This seems wrong. Now, you'll feel remember in the chronology, Shakespeare begins with this collaborative effort that is Henry VI, parts uh, two and three. We don't know how much of those plays were Shakespeare's, although we sense a lot of Shakespeare's for example, the meter and the the word use, and and um, also some of the um, some of the the rhetorical devices that he uses. We sense Shakespeare behind most of the lines. However, in this rewriting, he gained the enmity of Robert Greene. And I've mentioned here the university wits. You've got Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Nash, George Peel, John Lilly, and Thomas Lodge. They're the ones who had been writing plays and had been very successful, thank you, until Shakespeare came along. So he is the upstart crow, beautified with our feathers. This is uh, Green's prose. With his tigers, remember we didn't mark possessives at the time, with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide. So this is from the Henry VI trilogy, a line about Margaret of Anjou, and he's using it uh, to make fun or poke fun of Shakespeare. So a tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide. He supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you. And being an absolute Johannes Factotum, or Jack of all trades, is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. This is about as insulting as you can get uh, for the time, and it shows that these people clearly were worried about what Shakespeare would be able to do on the stage. So using his own words to mock him, um, a jack of all trades, how can an actor bombast but also write blank verse? And he, he is, he's particularly rankled, um, and you sense that in, in the degree to which he goes to, to make fun of Shakespeare. There are some subtle distinctions um, between actor, owner, and playwright here that we want to notice. Green does not like the actors. Trust them not. Uh, the actors control the theaters, and here come these two names I've already mentioned, Richard Burbage, the actor. James is the father, Richard the son, but James is the one who began the company that moved from Lord Strange's to um, finally become the Kingsman in, in 1605, I believe. And um, Henslow is the other uh, impresario, if you will, who ran a, a troupe for which Shakespeare wrote early with their star actor, Edward Allen. And then you had the other acting companies. So here we have Lord Stranges to Lord Chamberlain's, and there are a few metamorphoses in between, but we end up being the Kingsmen. The Lord Admirals remained under Philip Henslow's control. Okay, um, the university was considered the only place where I could learn to write poetry. So how can, Green is suggesting in this text, how could somebody just come in, especially an actor who's only supposed to memorize, how could he come in and, and write poetry of this level? It must not have been favorably received because his publisher had to issue a public apology for this groat's worth of wit uh, written by Green. So an interesting invective which shows us a little bit how much the uh, status quo was uh, disturbed by Shakespeare's work. Another early reference is from uh, Thomas Nash. Here he's pictured as a jailbird. He got in quite a bit of trouble, but he writes a defense of the theater, and in it he talks about Shakespeare's, and perhaps his, because he may have been one of those hands working on Henry VI, part one, 
where he talks about the famous hero Talbot, uh, one of Shakespeare's few unequivocal heroes, military heroes. Um, here you have the reference. And, and um, this is in his book, Pierce Penniless, his supplication to the devil, but he's defending the theater in this. Nash's goal is to talk about how bringing on these wonderful characters such as Talbot can affect the audience for the better. And we can think of catharsis again, although he's not really mentioning it per se. He talks about how Talbot's bones are new embalmed with the tears of 10,000 spectators at least, um, showing that uh, these characters bring about better things in human beings. And so the spectators actually benefit from plays. All right, so quite different from Green's invective. And a final reference is from a person who collected quotes into his commonplace book. A commonplace book was hardly uncommon. Many people wrote commonplace books where they would put sententia or discussions. And here he wants to talk about some of the, the different uh, comparative discourse of our English poets with the Greek, Latin, and Italian poets. So he's going to show where we excel. And this is where we learn some of the plays uh, that Shakespeare has written. So he talks about the mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare, witness his Venus and Adonis, his Lucrece, his sugared sonnets among his private friends, etc. Etc. is, is uh, highly suspect, by the way. You might want to pay attention to when it's used. Plautus and Seneca are accounted, for the best, accounted the best for comedy and tragedy among the Latins. So Shakespeare among the English is the most excellent in both kinds for the stage. So he is considered, 1598, the most excellent. Here we have Gentleman of Verona, his errors, his labors lost, and his labors won. Probably much ado. His Midsummer Night's Dream, his Merchant of Venice, his tragedy of Richard II, Richard III, Henry IV, King John, Titus Andronicus, and Romeo and Juliet. So we have a nice listing of the plays with which this reader, Francis Mears, was familiar in 1598 and which he could judge. All right, so we, in fact, through this uh, handout, you see the movement from um, invective aimed at Shakespeare for his upstart crow behavior, taking over the, the writing of plays after having been an actor. And again, we don't know how long Shakespeare had been acting, but he was an actor before he was a playwright, to the use of Shakespeare's creative skills to support why theater is a good thing and should be maintained, and that was uh, Thomas Nash. And finally, we end with Francis Mears comments that give us the idea that by 1598, Shakespeare had indeed um, made his career for um, not just these well-known, um, We finally end with uh, 1598, Francis Mears comments that show in what way Shakespeare had, had succeeded, whether it was with the poetry, the, the narrative poetry in the sonnets, or with the plays. And we have listings of plays which help us as well with the dates. And that concludes your session on early references to Shakespeare.